Love, passion. Some people have been having affairs with the plants they grow for years, whether they call themselves horticulturists, gardeners, or florists. This romantic obsession with the things they grow and nurture is all-consuming. And at the Chelsea Flower Show, this love affair is intoxicating. The heady scent of exotic and commonplace trees and shrubs and flowers as you enter the big marquee is overwhelming. This is the place for new varieties, new trends. Of course, Chelsea isn't without its glamour. On Monday, press day, the place is swarming with celebrities. And later that afternoon, the royal family make their official visit. But we'll be up close and personal with the plants, so have a notepad and pencil ready to jot down this year's new varieties. We'll be following the ladies and gentlemen of the Three Counties and South Wales branch of the National Association of Flower Arrangement Societies. And Julia Mackenzie will be here picking out the new plant she wants to grow in her Oxfordshire garden. gardeners, it strikes me, come to Chelsea Flower Show for three things. They come to seek out new plants, they come to seek new inspiration, and they come, as Virgil put it, to be gobsmacked. And this garden, designed by Rupert Golby for Country Life magazine and Hiscox Insurance, definitely falls into that last category. It is, of the 22 gardens, the most opulent. Through there, the parkland, and this side of the gates, the sunken garden. Here you'll find contemporary craftsmanship as well as traditional. Within the Tudor brick gazebos are works of art by Henry Moore and Sickert. And in the garden itself, gates by Richard Quinnell of Leatherhead and furniture by Viscount Linley. If you wanted to buy this garden, it would set you back £300,000. But then it is Country Life magazine centenary, so why shouldn't they do it this year? There's only one thing missing in this garden that's so profusely planted with English flowers, and that is the girl in pearls. But there is an ice maiden. But this is the kind of country life that's familiar to more of us. The rusting plough, the broken down gate, and the old cattle shed. This is Roger Platt's spout garden. It is that classic cottage garden idyll with arbours and pergolas and borders overstuffed with roses and shrubs and fragrant perennials. But there is one difference between this and all the other gardens here, and that is that Roger grew all the plants himself. It's called the Spout Garden, Roger. Presumably that's the inspiration, is it? It is, Alan, yes. <laughs> it comes from my childhood when I, uh, my father used to collect water from the spouts on the other side of the hill for his cows and for the well when it ran a bit dry. But there, really, the similarity ends. This is a bit of Chelsea magic now, isn't it, really? What about growing your own plants, though? Is it a bonus or is it a real pain? It, it's, it's both, but it's really a bonus. It's, it's very challenging. You don't know until you get here really what you're going to use. At least you can rely on the plants that you've got because you know what you've got and what you've grown. Do you get a chance to look around the other gardens here? I mean, I was across this morning at those 13 courtyard gardens, really tiny plots put together by horticultural societies across Britain and by colleges. They're brilliant. They are fantastic. And to see how much that they pack into such a small area, it's almost a, a fantasy world that one walks into. This one is a seaside jewel box. Sparsholt College of Horticulture in Hampshire have transformed their pocky-tanky patch into a place of maritime memories. Sea lavender grows up between tortured chunks of driftwood, and all the plants have maritime associations. Spiral seashells push up among potted rosettes of sempervivums. Sea urchins stud the pebble-topped earth around sea pinks or thrift. And the enjoyment isn't over until the fat lady jumps into the water. Somehow, I don't think she'll make it. 
And if you ever wondered why the hostas in your garden are always full of holes, Selsden and District Horticultural Society have the answer. This is the guy responsible, the snail maker. But it wasn't snails that did for the hostas on this garden, designed by Christine Pritchard for Wyvale Garden Centres. Nope, it was the early May frost. In spite of the fact that the plants were growing in a polythene tunnel, it blackened them to the ground. Not that you'd know from looking at it, the people of Gloucestershire pulled together. The mature trees, like this 60-year-old Japanese maple, came from Western Burt Arboretum. And the stone to build the walls with this cock and hen top to stop the sheep from jumping over, that came from a Cotswold quarry. Well, it was meant to, but the quarry owner, Colin Lewis, said no. You don't want new stone, you want reclaimed stone. I'll take down my barn. So he did, and they built a gazebo. The trouble was, they ran out of stone. And he said, never mind, I'll take down the side of my house. The side of his house is now covered with polythene until the show ends. But you see, that's the thing about Chelsea. Everybody pulls together. Mind you, that doesn't make it any less nerve-wracking for the first timer. Zar Tolmash has never designed a Chelsea garden before, but this one that she's put together for the London Evening Standard shows no signs of the novice. The planting and the finish are as near to perfection as it's possible to achieve. From the wild and woolly area outside the kitchen of this London house, you pass through a wrought iron gate decorated with arum lilies, picked up by real arum lilies in the central bed of this formal garden. And over here, the pièce de résistance, a border planted up with old-fashioned shrub roses, pale blue irises, purple ornamental alliums, lavender and catmint. It's turned out as I wanted it to look. I'm really pleased and excited about it because um, it looks as, as what I dreamt about. So what did you dream about? I dreamt basically about a beautiful garden to be in, to live in. Um, a sort of classically simple garden with all my favourite plants. Did you have anybody in mind when you designed this garden? Yes, we did. We had a fictitious couple called Charles and Jocasta. And Charles is a successful city businessman, and he wants to bring home his clients and entertain them on the terrace, and he wants a fairly traditional garden. But he married quite a sort of arty girl, Jocasta, and she's the one who goes to all these art exhibitions and uh, brings home the terracotta, the wrought iron, and the, and the sculptures to fit in with their garden. Most of the plants outside in the gardens at Chelsea probably once made their debut inside the marquee. It's now dawn on Tuesday morning and I've got the biggest marquee in the world exclusively to myself. Until they open the gates. For five days this is home to nurseries, amateur societies, international exhibits, new companies and old. for the first time is one display of all British fruit, vegetables and flowers. With clever design they make a stunning combination. You've got quite a span of produce here. Yes, we've got growers from Penzance to Penrith who have supplied us. We've got gorgeous um, garlic from the Isle of Wight. We've got super roses from the Isle of Man. And we've got some lovely aubergines also from Humberside which have been pollinated by bees. We think colours are, are great sources, either contrasts or actual same colour schemes. So osteospermum with uh, cabbages, also we have aubergines right next to real shocking pink uh, impatiens or busy lizzies. It really makes an eye-catching design that leads you on to your next exhibit. Lilies and cucumbers, they're super together, aren't they? I know you think they are, <laughs> but I think, I think cauliflowers and that are nicer with lilies. <laughs> Now, the exhibitors from furthest afield have come all the way from Melbourne, Australia. The city of Melbourne asked us to create autumn in Melbourne. And what we've tried to do is pick up and give you an, 
and just a small synopsis of what Melbourne is like during autumn with the wonderful selection of banksias, our wonderful fruits and vegetables. And last week they were growing in the wild. They have a system in Australia where some people have the rights to uh, farm flowers from the wild. These plants really in the bush would grow in the well-drained sandy sort of soils and uh, as you would understand a bush is not like a forest tree upon tree upon tree of them. It's um, maybe a, a clump of trees of banksias and then you might walk 50 metres to another clump of trees. So they're not condensed area, it's quite a wide and spreading area so that you get a variety of trees growing in the one area. Well, that exclusivity didn't last long. The gates are open and it's everyone for themselves. Forcing my way through the crowds, I found some plant detectives from the Hardy Plant Society. I think detective is rather a good word. They're, they're scarring the hedgerows, uh, neighbours' gardens, friends' gardens, I think, as well. And they will spot something. It's amazing what does turn up that they track down. We want to encourage people to grow as wide a range of, of hardy perennials as we possibly can not always ones that are easily available perhaps in, in nurseries but ones that need to be carefully tended in gardens. There are a lot of good plants that were known in the past and for one reason or another they needed perhaps a little bit more care and attention. They might have faded out and we're very keen to find those and to keep them going. But we're also keen to get new plants and I think perhaps that's something as amateurs that we can offer. So what's attracting attention on your stand this year? Uh, we've had great fun with the Euphorbia rigida, this lovely uh, hardy Euphorbia from the Mediterranean with a very good colour form. And uh, there's a lovely white in Carvilla, which uh, again is standing out, particularly in the rather sort of soft light here. There's something that's uh, causing a lot of comment. Chelsea, like any social event, has two sides. The media chaos contrasts with the peaceful perfection of the gardens, but one man with his eye fixed firmly on maintaining the Royal Horticultural Society's aims is Director General Gordon Ray. To do this, he goes back to the Society's historical roots. Tell me how the RHS started. Well, it all started Liz, in, in March 1804 with a group of seven men who were real visionaries in the horticultural field. The, the actual founder of the society was a man called John Wedgwood, who was the son of the potter, Josiah Wedgwood. And he linked with a man called Sir Joseph Banks, who was president of the Royal Society. And there was a botanist, uh, two uh, royal gardeners, and one or two other people. And they met in Hatchard's bookshop in Piccadilly, which still exists now. And it was at that meeting, the very first meeting, that they decided that they would institute a society for the improvement of horticulture. And that, nearly 200 years ago, was the founding meeting for what you see today. So were they all enthusiastic amateurs? Well, there were a lot of enthusiastic amateurs, but also these very wealthy people as well. But as the society started to develop and there was a real interest in plants, then during the 1820s, 1840s, the society actually paid for plant hunters to go out to different parts of the world. I mean, there were two who were particularly famous. There was one called David Douglas who went out in the 1820s and he introduced probably 200, over 200 different species. And then later on there was another famous man called Robert Fortune and in 1843 he set off as well. And he went to China and he spent 20 years collecting plants. Things like this, wisteria from the Far East. The azaleas over here is probably the great granddaughter of one that he brought in originally. These were the people who in true Victorian fashion really brought home all of this great variety of plants, many of which you can see growing around you today. Now the present Queen very often comes to Chelsea Flower Show. Is she the first royal to patronise the society? Not at all, no. The first royal to do it was in fact Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, became president in the late 1850s and he did a lot to turn the society round. And then in 1897, which was the 60th anniversary of Queen Victoria coming to the, to the throne, the society decided that it would like to honour her in some way. So they decided that they would have a medal and they called it the Victoria Medal of Honour. And this is the highest award that the society gives. 
and it's given to people who have made an outstanding contribution to horticulture in this country. Later on, at the end of the reign, what they decided was that because she had reigned for 63 years, that we would in fact have 63 people holding the Victoria Medal of Honor at any one time. There are now only 61, but this year, two of them are actually here at the show, John Hillier and Charles Notcutt. And Charles Notcutt is celebrating at this show the 100th anniversary of the founding of Notcutt's Nurseries. Are they deadly rivals, these two? I imagine that when they're at the show like this, whilst all of this is going on next to each other, there is a certain amount of rivalry, but outside, they're very good friends. Have the royals always visited the show? Well, yes, we have been honoured by the royal visits for a long time. George V and Queen Mary came, and members of the royal family right up until the present day. And each year, the Queen comes on Monday, and until a few years ago, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother came as well, because they're both still patrons of the society. A glorious sunny Monday afternoon, and the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, and other members of the royal family have come to admire the show. Now, there are at least two perfumes being launched at the show this year, and goodness knows what else. Isn't it getting rather commercial? Well, I'm not sure that it is, Liz. It, this show costs the Royal Horticultural Society in excess of £2 million to stage. And we are a charity, we are Britain's gardening charity, and we have a mission. And the mission is to encourage and to improve the science, the art and the practice of horticulture in all its branches. And so we are need to be able to earn money to support those works. But whether it's becoming more commercial or not, the one thing that we must remember is the horticulture in horticultural society. And at the end of the day, the plants are still the real stars of the show. Well, there's a new flower that Gordon Red probably go bananas over. He's been growing chrysanthemums since he was eight years old. So that new variety, Matthew Woolman, which is a pale pink reflex that normally flowers in November, is probably on his shopping list. Of course, Chelsea's always been the launch pad for new varieties. And if you have your pen and paper ready, here's our pick of the best. The latest Alstroemeria, or Princess Lily, from Peter J. Smith has been named after Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. These are really good garden plants if you can get them through their first few winters. And they don't get attacked by greenfly. They've got a built-in insecticide. There are already yellow petunias, but Prism Sunshine is the first large flowered yellow petunia. Very pretty pale yellow. It's won a 1998 Fluoro Select Gold Medal, and it's available in your new season seed catalogue. The last thing you want in a bird garden is a cat among the pigeons. So it's hardly surprising that in Bonnie Guinness's bird garden, this ivy leaf pelagonium, sold in the States as Tom Cat, is sold in Britain as Tom Boy, the darkest ivy leaf pelagonium in cultivation. Dawn is a new variety of sweet pea. Now, you may find the colours a little on the weak side. That's because I'm delighted to say it's been bred primarily for its scent. To me, there is nothing like the smell of freshly cut sweet peas, and Dawn does very well. English nurseryman John Metcalf was touring a Dutch nursery when he spotted this poppy that was about to be thrown out. If you want it, they said, we'll name it after you. And he's rather glad that they did. It turns out to be a semi-double which has a second flush later on in the summer. Poppy John Metcalf looks set for a rosy future. These are the new violas from Japan. They were sown as seed only in September and they've been flowering continuously since February. They are ground cover violas, which means they really will spread for you without dying off in the middle. They're quite something. A lot of people can't get on with cacti because they think they're unfriendly and don't actually do anything. But Brian Goody of Southfield Nursery intends to prove them wrong. He's bred this Alostera apricot ice, which flowers reliably right the way through the summer and has spines that are so soft you can even stroke it without getting them in your finger. There's a good boy. This new delphinium is exceptionally tall. It's about seven foot. It's called Pandora. It's a bright mid-blue, black centre and tiny blue flecks in it. 
Here's a good new garden plant, provided you're not on chalky soil, a rhododendron offered by Burncoos Nurseries and raised at Kay's Castle in Cornwall. It's a hybrid between rhododendron Williamsianum and rhododendron decorum, and it's called Celtic Cross. What are you Hello. doing? <laughs> I brought you a plant I think you might like for your theatre. What? Ah, an a lovely, auricula. It's a lovely auricula. What do you think? For me, auricula theatre. It's gorgeous. It's a very, very unusual brown uh, flowered auricula. It's actually called brownie. Now, guess where it comes from? Brownie. I have no idea. Pudsey. Pudsey in Yorkshire. It must be a damn good garden plant, that. <laughs> Pudsey is not just home to this plant. It's also bred one Alan Titchman. Well, Ilkley, just up the road. <laughs> designers who come back to Chelsea year after year but it's fun to look for the new faces and to try to spot the up-and-coming talent. Stephen Woodham's design for Yardley has a glass circular structure at its heart and wide wooden decking which adds to the airy feel. His theme is Baroque. Well the planting really um, is the most wonderful example of um, garden history of the Baroque style which is a very small part of garden history actually in Geneva and I saw photographs of that and it was a very structured garden, it was all about sort of um, textures and shapes and also the spiral U is a, is a very definite strong Baroque style. Was it difficult to mix the formal topiary elements of the garden with the informal flowing flowery elements? Um, I guess actually when I was putting it together on the drawing board it was extremely difficult because it was kind of like mixing something that was very strict and then the loose forms. Um, but again that is typical Baroque style and sort of having shapes and spirals and squirrels is what it's all about. If future summers are as hot as they tell us they're going to be, then we'll all need a garden like this one designed by Simon Shire for the Daily Mirror. A sort of Cotswold cottage cross souk, and then out here a garden packed full of plants that love sun. But, Simon, are they really drought tolerant? Totally. On our free draining soil, they would also survive the winter, which is very important. And with cordylines, you can lift the leaves up, and if you pack them with straw or bubble wrap, they will survive through the winter. There is one thing I have to ask you about, though, the olive tree over there. Now, could you really get that through a British winter? Uh, when it's very young, it's very difficult. But um, if you pack the stem, because um, this is the main thing, it's the stem when they're young. When they're very small, they tend to split. But if they're in a sheltered position, no problem. So when they're old and gnarled, they're OK? They are fine. I know of just one such specimen, but it's in Provence next, next door. door. <laughs> True, just over the wall, a garden in Provence has been created for British Sky Broadcasting by Fiona Lawrenson. Now, at 28, she might be the youngest garden designer here at Chelsea, but she's by no means unaccomplished. Last year, she won a gold medal for a New England cottage garden, and this year, we're in the south of France. <laughs> it all looks very Provençal, <laughs> the colour-washed yeah. walls, the archways. Where did all this come from, the architecture? Well, it, we had great fun. We went to Provence for a week, and we really just went on a shopping spree, which was even better, because <laughs> you spend somebody else's money. I but want that uh... arch, I want that well. <laughs> yeah. okay. Now, the garden is a rhombustious mixture of, of alliums and lavender and tobacco plants. Is that typically Provençal? It is. I mean, unlike uh, the British, the French aren't a nation of gardeners. But when the French go gardening, they do it with great style. And this is um, an example of some of the things we actually saw in Provence. What about the people who look at this and say, yes, but really, it's just a piece of Hollywood stage <laughs> set? Well, there have been a few comments like that, but at the end of the day, people come to Chelsea Flower Show to see the best and to see a little, a little piece of Provence or a little bit of Morocco or wherever in the, in the show. And I think this has really worked because you need the buildings, you need the setting, so that when you actually walk in here, you feel that you are in Provence. Well, you fooled me. I will do when I give you a glass of wine. Oh. <laughs> Excuse us, just a moment. <laughs> now,
Now, this garden is proving something of a showstopper. It's based on a garden which actually exists in Marrakesh. Created by the French artist Majorelle in the 1920s, it lay forgotten and overgrown until the 1970s, when it was rediscovered by the fashion designer Yves Saint Laurent, who set about renovating it. Gay Search flew to Morocco to meet the Chelsea designer Madison Cox and his contractor Richard Baxter. The Majorel Garden was first created in the late 20s, early 30s by Jacques Majorel, a um, French painter who settled here in 1929. And somewhat like Claude Monet at Giverny, over time created a garden and it became more and more involved in the garden. The garden became the backdrop for many paintings and very similar to Monet, started collecting exotic and rare plant material. One of the things that we discussed in London was the um, fountain. Right. Richard so Baxter, the English contractor responsible for building the Chelsea Garden, the came itself? to see the yes. real McCoy and, and to find the out what elements in Madison Cox's design he would need to bring back from Morocco. Right. I think the, um, the other part that we were discussing as to whether to have this, this work here um, the arches. The arches and things made here in, in Morocco to get that feel from the sort of local craftsmen. This is really just simple plywood. I mean, it's nothing uh, complicated, and I think that we could probably just have that done in England. This, on the other hand, I think we should have made here. Mm -hmm. It's going to be this turned wood. It's going to be quite complicated, I think, costly to have it made in England. So we'll, this we'll go see um, later this afternoon. Actually, there you see, there you can see how he's turning the wood. Tiles in the restored garden are handmade by local craftsmen, so that's what Madison wants for the Chelsea garden. But if you look at this man right here, how he's cutting out, you see how he's chiseling away to make right. little small little squares? Yeah. yeah. And they're all individually cut by hand. It's a tradition that's you know, passed down from family to family. Obviously this is a very large garden and the plot you have at Chelsea is very small. What would you say was the essence of this garden that you, you wanted to distill and actually present in the Chelsea garden? I think what I wanted to really try to capture was um, the magical qualities that I think that this garden has. Um, well, there's a great constant play of light and shadow, um, plant forms contrasting against each other, but in very bold fashion. Um, obviously, we can't recreate the garden by any means, but to use certain um, elements of its vocabulary, this, the bright use of color, and the color doesn't really come from the plant material so much as it comes from the hardscape features, such as the walkways, um, the pots as you've seen, the pergolas, the structures. And that the plants are almost a backdrop, but a very interesting backdrop to all of this, this, this melding of various elements, I think. One of the, the striking features of the, the hard landscaping here is this blue. This the Majorelle blue. It's become blue. known as the Majorelle blue, yes. Yeah. That was originally something that Jacques Majorelle uh, saw on his voyages um, into the mountainous regions of Morocco and, and all of North Africa. I believe it was a color used to ward off evil spirits. And so he saw this vivid blue that was used. So he, he, he incorporated that blue. He also incorporated that ochre color that you see um, from the mud walls of even the ramparts of the, of the city of Marrakesh. Now, around here somewhere, yeah, here he is. This is the man that sells the pigments. Yes. Just the powdered pigments. Right. And so we have, and the way they sell it here is this, you choose the ribbon color, and then that's... Right. So we're going to ask him for a blue. Bonjour. Alors, je peux voir. I really love that window. Isn't it wonderful? We were going to, thinking of having one made, but I think it's going to be easier to find an old antique window. The bright yellow against the Majorelle blue. The Majorelle is blue. Stunning, isn't, isn't it? it? Yeah. yeah. It really pops, yeah. yeah. And then this is the square pool, uh -huh. which we will also be doing at Chelsea with the fountain. And um, the idea of the square within a square, again, is, is um, very Islamic and one that I. I'm very keen on the idea of all that geometry within the garden, and so it's quite fascinating to me. So all you have to do now is just translate it to Chelsea? It, with a lot of work and sweat, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But can you really transfer a two-acre garden in North Africa to this tiny site at Chelsea? What I tried to do here was to make a garden that was 
um, had the spirit of the Majorelle Garden in Morocco and not just a recreation of it, to take certain themes from that garden and bring them to Chelsea. Hello. Well, it's always such a privilege and pleasure to come to this Royal Flower Show every year, but this year particularly so because I've acquired a new garden and I can't wait to get started on searching for new plants. So, um, shall we go this way first? Well, of course, I've been tempted immediately into the Grand Marquis. Um, these blue poppies are just sensational. And, and the white digitalist, uh, I'd love to get some height into the garden. And of course, it must contain hostas. I don't really have an overall plan for this garden yet, but, um, ah, round here might be just the answer. There's a, it's very windy in the Windrush Valley, it's very aptly named, and these grasses might be just perfect. Yes, indeed. I can just see them now moving in the wind. Um, I'm told at a moment that grasses are very fashionable. I think this means that they are readily available. I don't normally go for very strong colours in the garden, but this stand could change my life. I mean, just look at them. Look at the colours. Look at the different types of the crinkly edges. That I, well, I just love a tulip from the beginning to end of its life in every way. Just look at the varieties. Oh, oh, be still my heart. Isn't that the most glamorous colour you've ever seen? It, oh. Now, I'd really like to receive something like that on a first night in the theatre, so if any of my friends are watching, I think the variety is called Mirella. Hmm, wonderful. Well, I think I'd better catch my breath here. I mean, such colour, so many varieties. I, I'm more confused than when I started. I just don't know what I'm going to put in this perfect garden, except box. I'm definitely going to put box because I want a herb garden edged with box. No, I want a herb garden edged with that. What is it, rosemary, lavender? Oh, it's beautiful. Ah, it's cotton lavender. Oh, no, 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 wrong. First rule of garden shows, don't touch the plants. And this one says it's moth and cat repellent. It doesn't mention golden retrievers, so it's okay for me. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful soft edging. So many varieties, like a Dartington curry plant, Gold tip marjoram, oh, lemon verbena, Vietnamese coriander, never heard of that before. Yes, I think this garden is really beginning to form up. Oh! I've always had a great love of plants, but I suppose as I'm getting older, it's quite natural that it's becoming an absolute passion now. And with a new garden, with endless possibilities, the future looks wonderful terribly exciting. This is it. I found it. This for me is Shangri-La. It's the sort of garden you could really get lost in. It has tranquility, harmony, wonderful features like this little dripping tap here, a wonderful water trough in the far corner that looks as though it's been there for years and years. The highest compliment I think I can pay any gardener is to say that the garden just happened, and that's just what it looks like. It's tremendous. I'm, I'm so happy I've had such a wonderful day here. If only I could take this en masse back to the Cotswolds. I can dream. <laughs> Of course, it's all the fault of Constance Spry. It was she who caused a sensation and started a new fashion craze for floral arrangement at Chelsea Flower Show back in 1937. Now, there are queues outside the floral marquee, but the big deal is to be chosen to represent the National Association of Flower Arrangement Societies in the big marquee. I wouldn't say they were a competitive bunch, but they only get one chance every 21 years, so the heat is on and the oasis is out. This year, the men and women of the three counties and South Wales region have masterminded their showstopper at the foot of the Malvern Hills in Course, Gloucestershire. It's the Thursday before the show, and they're packing up everything except the kitchen sink for their towering creation. These are super Nectarose Scordum Silicum. 
But the question is, will they be out by Sunday? I think I should just get a few of these Siberian iris for our bog garden section. Look at those, they're just gorgeous. It's Saturday now, and there are 11 of them on the stand. Bob's sorting out his bog garden. Jean is trying to get her head round the Latin names because she's got to make out the plant list. Nan is responsible for the terrace and the steps, and June, well, she's just sort of whipping them all into shape from a kneeling position. How do you decide, out of all your members, who you're going to bring? Well, they have to have a probe and record. Sounds like criminal. Demonstrators, successful competitors, good work in church festivals. But you can only pick 11 of them. Well, how do you pick 11 out of 5,000? You pick them on Thursday. Yes. They've got to last until next Friday. Yes. So that's over yes. a week. Yes, when, when, you, when you're picking them, you, you look. First of all, we want a bit of colour. So we want to make sure we've got some colour for Monday when we're getting the judging. But of course, we, we are aware it's on. But it, fortunately, these with the digitalis do keep going on up. And it's, we just want to see something with a hint of a colour. And we're, we're on the way. This is Pat. They all said, you must go and see Pat because she's got this wonderful garden. And a lot of the stuff's come from your garden. A so lot of it, yes. How did you decide which ones to choose and cut for this show? You've got to have a variety so that we can use them at the stand there. More ferny eye. That one there. I have and to the different greens go all together. I have to tell you that you're probably likely to be disqualified if you use these plants. Yes. Because there's a rule at Chelsea which says no livestock and there's a snail <laughs> on there. There are 21 areas now, including Northern Ireland, who joined NAFAS just recently. And so we basically take it in turns. So we're not likely to get a, a chance to do this for another 20 years. We've got something. Oh, we've got a card, what anyway. Is that? <gasps> silver. Oh, silver. Oh. Oh. Do you know my heart's pounding? There are some exhibits in the marquee that make me feel like a small boy in a sweet shop. And this is one of them. Reginald Kay from Silverdale in Lancashire have long been famed for growing hardy ferns. Now they've cast their net wider to include more shade-loving plants like these Himalayan poppies. To grow these well, you need shelter and shade and a soil so rich in leaf mould, well-rotted garden compost, cow manure and horse manure that it never dries out. It should almost be like fruitcake, good enough to eat. And then you can grow these beauties well. If you hate botanical Latin, I'm sorry, stand by for a blast. Here you'll find Mechanopsis betonicifolia, fairly easy to grow from seed. The even deeper larger flowers of Mechanopsis sheldonii, burgundy in the bud, Asia in the bloom, and benefiting from dividing about once every three years. There's the harebell poppy, Mechanopsis quintuplinervia, with nodding blooms of lavender blue. But the star of the show is this beauty from China, Mechanopsis punicia, crumpled buds that unfurl into these nodding, deep, dusky red flowers that make the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. If you're looking for a pot plant for a warm, bright windowsill, then let me suggest the Cape Primrose or Streptocarpus. Just shade them from really scorching sun and they'll flower between April and November. And they're easy to propagate from leaf cuttings. The newest variety making its debut at Chelsea is Rhiannon slightly fragrant and Rex Dibley tells me he's trying to breed more fragrance into them as well as the ability to flower right the way through the winter. Watch this space. Some plants go out of fashion, others come in, and one plant which is in high fashion at the moment is the allium or ornamental onion. Rupert Bowlby has a stand absolutely covered in them. What's the secret then, Rupert? Why are they so in fashion? Well, they're such an easy bulb, and people didn't realise before there were eight or nine available. And until they saw more at Chelsea, they thought that was all there was. 
we showed more and more every year, and I've shown up to a hundred different varieties of one Chelsea. And people realise there's a wide range of different shaped flowers, different coloured flowers, and all you have to do is dig a hole in the ground, drop them in, cover them up, and they do the rest. Are people put off by the smell? No. Can you smell anything? Not from here. No, well, there's only about six or seven hundred within a few feet of you. If you walk on them, yes, then you'll have problems because um, you crush the leaves. But if you, what gardener walks all over the leaves of his plants? There is one aspect of fruit and vegetable growing that is more controversial than any other, and that is flavour. Nowhere more so than with strawberries. The variety that's offered most frequently in shops and supermarkets is this one, El Santa. But it's now being challenged by two newer varieties, Symphony and Eros, both of which have greater disease resistance. But for the home grower, where flavour is the most important thing, I reckon this one is hard to beat. Cambridge Late Pine. It may be 50 years old, but when it comes to flavour, it's yummy. If you're really looking to grab the limelight for your new horticultural stars, then the quickest route is to book a TV star. Press Day is seething with celebrities. This is uh, the Leslie Joseph Rose, which has been named after me, which is... <laughs> I'm really silly about it, actually. I just think it's such an honour, and I love it. It's been 10 years in development. And SENSE, which is the Rubella Association, which benefits the deaf and the blind, are benefiting to the tune of a pound for every rose of sold. It's very unusual, I think, to have something like this in a major city every, every single year. It's the fact that it is every year that people know that that's going to happen. The summer's coming. I get really sort of depressed and rather suicidal coming here, um, primarily because uh, I, I go back to my garden. and. I just can't believe what, how much I've got to do. I have a garden, and much more importantly, I have a gardener who's something of a plant nationalist, I'm sorry to say. So the odd suggestion that a rhododendron or two might not be out of place is met with a terse no. Do you get your hands dirty? Absolutely. <laughs> Yours is it's hard no as mine. It's fun if you don't get your hands dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have calluses? I do, because I garden, you see. Why do you have calluses, she said. I don't I use do, your cosmetics. I that's do, what. No, but I do with gloves. Do you like fast growers? Everything. I mean, I try to buy my plants as big as possible because I haven't got the patience to wait until they start growing out. No, because the garden at number 10, I remember you saying to me, don't look through that window, it's not terribly good. Oh, we've got a fabulous garden in Huntingdon. In Huntingdon. <laughs> do you get your hands dirty? Do you, do you garden? I'm going to. Every designer wants to create a beautiful, pleasing garden, but a few also want their work to operate at another level, perhaps a deeper level. Three gardens here tell the story of a life, or even more ambitiously, of life itself. Paul Cooper has in previous years been one of Chelsea's most adventurous and controversial names. This time, for sponsors Ford, he's produced an autobiographical garden. Dad's vegetable garden, that boyhood den, the first girlfriend, football. They all play their role in this cartoon of a garden. Paul Cooper's trip down memory lane. By involving your own lifestyle and bringing your own personality, you can create a garden which is truly yours. Too often, and often you see this at Chelsea as well, dare I say, you have what I call kind of fictitious nostalgia. It's as fake as a plowman's lunch, you know, it never really existed. It's dreamlike. This isn't dreamlike, this is real memories. And I think anybody could create a garden like this in their own garden by just drawing on inspiration from their own life. Walk through the Age Concern Garden and designer Christopher Picard aims to walk you through life itself in four stages, from birth to death. From birth and childhood, you meander to the age of responsibility. A job, a mortgage, a family. The path's rocky, it's uneven, and the landscape's stark. There's some delightful gentle planting in the third age, retirement, when you have time to explore life's maze. But look up, and you glimpse yourself in death's mirror.
glass, steel, rectangles. This bold idea tells another story of another life. Christopher Bradley Hole has looked back 2,000 years for his inspiration for the Daily Telegraph garden. The poet Virgil came from a humble rural background, made his fortune in Rome, and finally retired back to the countryside. You stroll through Virgil's childhood, a simple courtyard full of fragrant herbs and naturalistic meadow, to the river Tiber and Rome. Here's Virgil's retirement. It's densely planted in vibrant colors. It's a contemplative garden. I wanted to represent Rome in an abstract way, because I feel in a modern garden, there's no point in reproducing what went on in the past, but I feel one should take one's inspiration from the past. I'm more interested in looking at plants which evoke the spirit of something, rather than trying to um, necessarily reproduce um, what would grow well in Italy over in England. Ginger lilies and heliconias from Barbados. They've come a long way to this year's show, but like all the exhibitors, they've spent 18 months planning, preparing, creating, growing. So there are bound to be disappointments if you don't achieve a gold medal. The judges' decisions are always controversial. I wouldn't be a judge for all the tea in China. But then, if you want to keep up the gold standard, you have to be hard with your judging. And it does mean that those who achieve a gold medal can feel justifiably elated. I'm tremendously excited, and I'm on cloud nine. I can't really believe it's true. Well, I gather we've got the best in, uh, garden in show award, and, and that's a wonderful, tremendous, uh, prestigious honour. I am absolutely delighted. Wonderful. I couldn't express my feelings. We had 70 companies involved, so the phone's been going all day, and it's just been so lovely to tell them that all their efforts have been really worthwhile. The gold medal here really is a standard which, when the public look at the garden and say, I hope, say, we like that garden. This is the sort of garden I would like to have in my own home. Um, they admire it, and then see we've got a gold medal. They can see at least they're admiring something which is of a high standard. Hope you've enjoyed the show as much as we have. If you want to come and look at it yourself, I'm sorry, all the tickets have gone for Thursday and Friday, but hope you've enjoyed this one. And as we always say here, see you next year. Bye-bye.